Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. The, 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 the Lord is worthy of praise all the time. All the time. We can never praise him too much. Amen. And we can never praise him too loudly. Yeah. There's nothing that we give to God that is actually enough. Amen. So, you know, really, if we said praise the Lord uh, uh, 200 times, it wouldn't be too much. Yeah. So somebody should please, please praise the name of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Fisaya, please come here, mate. Come on. Um, really quickly, just want to um, say a couple of things. So next, how many people have children in, in the children's ministry, children's church? If you have kids there, can you raise your hand? You have kids there. Amen. Don't worry, I'm not about to tell you to go get your kids. Because some people are like, oh. <laughs> nope, you can sit down and enjoy the service. Amen. Your kids are going to be well looked after. But the people who look after them deserve our gratitude. Amen. Uh, the folks who, who serve in, the, in junior church, they deserve to be appreciated. You know, uh, every year they have this month that is dedicated to appreciating the pastors. And the pastors appreciate your appreciation. Amen. But the teachers in junior church, I think, are more deserving of our appreciation. So what we have done is next Sunday, uh, December the 2nd, I want us all to reach out to the teachers in junior church and just say thank you to them. Amen? For watching our kids, for giving us an opportunity to sit here and enjoy the service and participate in the service. Junior church is not perfect. You know, we've got some, some, some challenges and we're working actively to resolving all of those challenges. But the people who serve there deserve some gratitude, amen. So uh, buy them an apple, maybe a bit more than an apple, you know, maybe just a, a box of chocolates or something. You know, you, we, most of us can afford it. Just give them something to say, we appreciate you, thank you for your service, and God bless you, amen. amen. So Sunday, December 2nd, don't say you forgot. <laughs> in fact, I'm going to tell the people signing you in, your gift is your entrance, no gift. <laughs> your, child, your child will sit with you, and let's see what that's like. Amen. I'm just, I'm just playing. Just, let's be nice to the teachers. And then I want to have a meeting with all the ushers, all the ushers, even the ones who are not serving. Um, you're just sitting down in the service. Please, it's going to be a quick meeting. It's at 1 p.m. after the service. All the ushers, we're going to meet in the lounge. Amen. And then I want to recognize Mrs. Antonia Uche Ejogu. She's our Rinze's. And let's give her a round of applause. Amen. She's a... Uh, She's visiting us from Abuja in, in Nigeria. Thank you so much for worshiping with us. We're grateful to have you. So this is Arinze's church. Yes, we, and I promise to behave myself. Arinze, I'm going to behave myself. I'm not going to disgrace you today, amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's turn our Bibles to 1 Thessalonians, uh, the 5th chapter and the 23rd verse. And I'd like us all to read it together. Hallelujah. Are we all there? It's on the screen. Let's read it together. The count of three. One, two, and three. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So over the last few weeks, we have been talking about the way our soul works in relation to our spirit and our, our body. And uh, one of the things that we have said is that our body is the part of us with which we interact with the physical world, and our spirit is the part of us with which we interact with the spiritual realm. Our soul, our, our heart, our mind, is simply the processing center of all the data we collect through our spirit and through our bodies. And the reality is that we're more comfortable and more familiar with, with gathering information and, and gathering data from the physical realm. We're more comfortable with, with, you know, with analyzing the information we get through our bodies, you know, through our eyes, through our nose, through our ears. And we've been doing it since we were born. From the moment a child comes into this world, the child starts to process data that is gathered through his or her body. But getting data from the spiritual realm is a bit more complicated. And, and many of us, most of us, in fact, we struggle with it. And I remember what happened to me recently. I decided that I wanted to learn how to speak Spanish. Amen? I don't know why some people are laughing. 
at the thought of me speaking Spanish. I actually, you know, I got all the apps, you know, got all the, got a few books, because I really wanted to learn how to speak Spanish. I mean, you live in Texas, you know, you're going to, you, sh you should try, yeah? And, and I really tried, and I got as far as um, ese, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, uh, um, vamonos, vamonos. Sounds very much like what we say in Nigeria, vamos. <laughs> You know, and, and I also understand hola, amigo, and if it's a woman, amiga, yeah, and, and, and you know, and that was it, you know. <laughs> como, como what? Yes, that's true. <laughs> and the, the problem was that, you know, my mind has gotten used to speaking English, Yeah. I've been speaking English since I was born. My first language is English. My parents taught us English, or my father spoke only English to us when we were growing up. So I, I understand English. My mind is wired in English, amen? But as I grew up a little bit more, my mother started to speak Yoruba to us. So again, my mind understands Yoruba. I sometimes think in Yoruba and translate into English. You know, when I'm texting, it's a bit of a problem because I'm texting in Yoruba, then translating into English. You know, but I've been doing that since I was a child. You know, it's, it's reflex. I don't have to, to think. I just speak and, and the thoughts just form. Yeah? But now that I'm an adult, I started trying to learn Spanish when I entered my late 40s. Yeah? Some people are looking at me like, only late 40s? I'm not 50 yet, please. So I started trying to learn Spanish. I'm not 50 yet. <laughs> what, what do you say? Wow. See, see how they are dragging me? You guys, chill. Five months is a long time. Amen? Before I reach 50, I will, don't worry, I, I will show you that I'm a young guy. Next time I come to church, my jeans will be ripped. Skinny. No, skinny is, a, skinny is a young man's game. <laughs> anyway, 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 anyway. So now I'm trying to learn Spanish. I'm an old man. It's, it's a struggle. Yeah, because it's hard to learn a, a language, a new language as an adult. But if you teach a child early, the child can speak multiple languages. Now, it's the same thing with understanding the spiritual realm, yeah? It is harder because we're starting so late in life. But we must understand the spiritual realm because the key to success comes from the spiritual realm. And if we ignore it, we ignore it at our own peril. There's a guy that the Bible talks about who had no idea what was going on in the spiritual realm. And it came and beat him in the behind. His name was Job. And the Bible calls him a righteous man. But one day, a meeting was held in heaven. Uh, let's read the story of that meeting. Job, the first chapter and the sixth verse. The Bible says, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? And Satan answered, from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? There is no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. God said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? And many people interpret that to mean that God was drawing Satan's attention to Job. But the verses that follow show you that Job had already seen, sorry, Satan had already seen Job. He had already seen him and had already marked him. Satan had observed him carefully, amen? Because look at what Satan says. He says, does Job fear God for nothing? Then he goes, have you not put a hedge around him? How did he know? Say, so have you not put a, a, a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You have blessed the work of his hands. So Satan is telling God. So when God said to, to, to Satan, have you not seen my servant Job? He was kind of saying, you've been checking out my guy. You've been checking out my boy. And Satan is like, yeah. You, you, you have, you, his flocks and his herds are, are spread throughout the land. But now stretch out your hand and strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. 
And the Lord said to Satan, very well then, everything he has in your power, he has is in your power, but on the man himself, do not lay a finger. Then Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Job had no idea that Satan was already scoping him out. Because he wasn't aware of what was going on in the spiritual realm. Satan was already, you know, marking the boundaries of his life. He had noticed the hedge the Lord built around him. He had actually counted his flock. The Bible says that the devil goes through and through the whole earth looking for whom he will devour. And he had set his sight on Job. So he understood the, the dimensions and the parameters of Job's life. And Job had no clue. And then they hold this meeting in heaven and God is there and the angels are there. And Satan himself too is there. And at that meeting it was decided that Job would go through a period of terrible suffering. In order to prove his commitment to God. Now, Job was not at the meeting. He lived in a dispensation where God uh, did not live in men. Where the spirit of God would only visit men occasionally. And even though he was a righteous man. Even though he was a good guy. He had no idea. He was totally oblivious to what was going on in the spiritual realm. He was secure in his goodness, but he didn't realize how insecure he really was. And many of us are content with not knowing what is going on in the spiritual realm. And we think that if we do not know, then we're immune from its effects. <laughs> it's like the person who doesn't understand the laws of gravity and think, you know, I don't believe in it. I don't understand it. I'll be fine. Well, alas. <laughs> so he had no idea. He was oblivious. He did the barest minimum, offering sacrifices, but he never really bothered to understand what was going on. So the devil is paying attention to him. The devil is watching him, and he has no clue. And they're discussing him in heaven, and he has no clue. Now, now Jesus, on the other hand, walks the face of the earth, but he had a totally different experience with the spiritual. The Bible says in John chapter 5, verse 19, Jesus gave them this answer. Very truly, I tell you, the son can do nothing by himself. He can do only what he sees. Don't you remember, say what he sees. he sees. He can do only what he sees his father doing. Because whatever the father does, the son also does. What Jesus Christ is saying to you is that I can see into the spiritual realm. I can see what is going on on that side of existence. And I translate into action the things that I see on that side. I only do in the physical what I have seen in the spiritual. I only do the things that I see my father who exists in the spiritual doing. Every miracle, every sign, every wonder, everything that Jesus Christ did on the earth that you and I can see or that you and I can read about, was a manifestation of something that he had seen taking place in heaven. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You cannot do on earth the will of God if you have not seen it being done in heaven. Jesus was literally just a mirror of what was going on in heaven. And then he even expands further. He says in John chapter 12, verses 49 to 50, that I don't even speak of my own volition. I only speak the things that I have heard already spoken in heaven. He says, for I did not speak on my own, but the Father who sent me commanded me to say all that I have spoken. I know that his command leads to eternal life. So whatever I say is just what the Father has told me to say. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ was a man, just like you. And in fact, the Bible calls him the son of man. It was important that Jesus Christ be a man. Now, God could have, could have caused Jesus to manifest from heaven as a spirit and, and just shazam, a man. But he subjected him to the process of humanity. A woman conceived, carried the baby for nine months, pushed the baby out through the birth canal. So that he would be a man in every way. But then the Bible tells us in Colossians chapter 2 verse 9. That even though he was a man. 
In him dwelled all the fullness. Touch your neighbor say all the fullness. All the fullness. Says all of God, the fullness of the Godhead dwelt in him bodily. That is why he had so much power. That is why he could say, I don't do anything except what I see God doing. God was living in him. God was dwelling in him. He was a man that had the spirit of God. That is why he could do the works that he did. That is why he could raise the dead and open blind eyes, cast out demons, make the lame walk, make the deaf hear. And that is why he insisted in the book of Acts chapter 1, verses 4 to 5. He said to the, the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem. Turn to your neighbor and say, do not leave Jerusalem. He says, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. He said to the disciples, don't go anywhere because, you see, everything that I am doing, everything that I have done, everything that I can do, I can only do because the, the, the fullness of the Godhead dwells in me bodily. And in order for you to do what I do, you need to wait in Jerusalem until you receive the gift of the Father, the Holy Spirit. By the way, the Holy Spirit is a gift. He's not a wage. You don't work for the Holy Spirit. You are given the Holy Spirit. So when somebody tells you, if you want to receive the Holy Spirit, fast for 40 days, they are full of it. The way some people are laughing, I'm suspecting that their mind went somewhere else. And in Romans 8, verse 10, look at what Paul says. He says, if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, says his spirit lives in you. I've been, I've been saying this every Sunday for four weeks. And I'm going to keep saying it every Sunday. The spirit of God is living in you if you have been baptized with the Holy Spirit. Amen. You have the same spirit that Jesus had. You have the same equipment that he had when he walked the face of the earth. We have the same tools that he was given. The spirit that lived in him and enabled him to do the things that he did that showed him what was going on in heaven. Because the Bible says nobody knows the things of a man except the spirit of a man. Nobody knows the things of God except the spirit of God. That spirit that knows the things of God was in Christ. And that spirit is in you. And this is God's will concerning you, concerning us. John 14 verse 12. Very truly, I tell you, tell your neighbor, I tell you. I tell you. It says, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing. Yes. It says, whoever believes in him will do what he has been doing. Now, what was he doing? He was going about, the Bible says, doing good. Yeah? He was laying hands on the sick. He was raising the dead. He was opening blind eyes. He was opening deaf ears. The lame, was, the lame were walking. He was turning five loaves of, 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 of bread and, and two fish into something that would feed thousands of people. He was, he was doing the miraculous. He, he's the guy that, that said to somebody, go catch a fish and, and open the mouth of the fish and there was a gold coin in it. He's the guy that was walking on water and was speaking to storms and, and cursing fig trees. That's what he did. And that's what he's saying that you and I, if we believe... We will do. And then he goes, and they will do even greater things Amen. than these. Amen. That means that we should be raising the dead. We should be healing the sick. We should be opening blind eyes. We should be prophesying and decreeing things. But if we are honest, that is not our experience. When was the last time you raised the dead? Because some people are looking at me like that. When was the last time you raised the dead? Okay, okay, you know, that's advanced spirituality. When was the last time you prophesied? When was the last time you gave a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom? When was the last time you laid hands on anybody who was sick? Now, I'm not even talking about laying hands on them and they were healed. When was the last time you even laid hands on them? Don't we know sick people? Every day, somebody around you has a cold, has a cough, has a headache. What does that say? You said, come, let me pray for you. Or you just pass them the Advil. 
just please, just take and don't disturb me. Or, or some of us, the germophobes, we put our hands in our pocket and say, hey. They know themselves. Where's Dami? Some of us walk around with hand sanitizer. Imagine Jesus walking around with hand sanitizer. No, seriously. So let's, let's cast the demon out of the guy. Peter. The way that we are, and Jesus is, is like, it's like two people with a smartphone. Two people with a smartphone. Who has a smartphone here? Shags, what, what kind of phone is that? What was that? Huh? What kind of smartphone is that? Which, which one? iPhone, which iPhone? I'm just trying to establish the smartness of the phone. Six, seven, four. Five. Okay, that's not smart. <laughs> people, people are not hiding their phones. <laughs> but, but seriously, imagine, imagine two people with an iPhone XS. Yeah, that's about the smartest you're going to get right now, yeah? One person, brand new iPhone XS. All they do with it is make calls. And they're feeling really chuffed. I, I have an iPhone. What can it do? It can make calls. What else can it do? It can make calls. That, that's all they do with it. But someone else has that same phone. And they are texting with it. They're, they're, they're doing video chats with it. They're doing group video chats with it. They're checking the weather with it. They're measuring rooms with it. They're doing so much with it. But the other guy with the smartphone, who only makes calls with it, is feeling chuffed. He's feeling like, yeah, I've got a smartphone. They should take that smartphone from you. Because you are underutilizing it. All we want to do is make calls. But our spirit, the spirit God has given us, can do so much more. It is about so much more. We're content with speaking in tongues. Have you been baptized the Holy Spirit? Yes, you speak in tongues. Yes, okay. That is such a small part of the presence of the Holy Spirit. It's the least part of it, almost. All the power that Jesus wielded came because of the Holy Spirit. And you have that same spirit. Amen. What are you doing with it? Amen. And there are a couple of reasons why we're like this. Number one, not in order of importance, but just I've listed it in different order in, in this particular. Number one, we have outsourced the work that Jesus has called us to do to a professional clergy. You know what I mean by professional clergy? The full-time and the half-time and part-time pastors and apostles and evangelists and bishops and superior evangelists and most holy apostles. We, Jesus Christ says, you will do what I do and greater works than this you will do, but we only expect that of the clergy. We only expect that of the professional pastors. So we have created this cadre of, of celebrity men of God. When you say, you can't say man of God, you have to say man of God. <laughs> this was never God's will. The, that that cadre, that celebrity, uh, this thing that we do is not scriptural. We are starting to worship men. Our leaders are becoming our idols. God never intended that the manifestation of the spirit would only come through one man in a gathering of, of 12. How can there be 12 men and only one man? Here's God. 12 Christians full of the spirit and only one. Then, then let's, let's, let's expand it to, to 400 and only one. 1,000 and only one. 20,000 and only one. That is not scriptural. We are turning these guys us guys, into what God never intended for us to be. And we struggle with God's will because we have done this. Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 tells us what the pastors are about. It says, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers. Why? To equip his people for works of service. 
The pastors, the evangelists, the bishops, the, the prophet, call them whatever you like. God gave them to equip you for the work of service. So when Jesus Christ says, you, you will do the works that I did and greater works than this you will also do, he was saying that these guys are supposed to help you do that, not for them to do it. But we, we say, you know, let them do it, let them do it, let the pastor do it. So somebody is sick, we're looking for a pastor. Somebody is having a challenge, we're looking for a bishop. What, what was your title, Shex? What's your title? Pa -pa pastor, no, 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 no. Let's, let's. See, uh, yes. <laughs> we, we want the big men of God with their, with their capes and their collars. But God is looking to you and I. That is why he didn't give only the big men of God the spirit. He gave it to all of us. So Shex has the spirit of God. Praise God. So do I. And so do you. And so do you. But what are we doing with it? We, we say, Shex, you, 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 you go. So we, we, we keep our own. And Shex should use his own. <laughs> Why? Because he has a title. He says he gave these men of God and women of God only to equip you. You are the one who should be opening blind eyes. You're the one who should be raising the dead. I, I said to them in the, first, in, the, in the first service that, you know, in the past, I used to assess myself by, you know, how many people in the church, how are they doing? No, 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 no. The question now is not how many people in the church, but how many people in the church can lay hands on the sick? How many people in the church are raising the dead? Forget about how many that have raised. How many people in I fail. Because what I have been called to is to equip you. And if I have not equipped you, forget about what I can do. Forget about what I, if I cannot transfer whatever gift I have, I have failed. So I can have a church of 25 million people. What percentage of the 25 million are healing the sick? Because the Bible says God gave me to the church. Not to do the work for the church. But to equip the church. Hallelujah. The second reason. Is that for so many, the gospel is no longer a platform through which the world can be saved, but a vehicle to enrich ourselves. Right. We're, not, we're not trying to preach the gospel. Let's be honest. Are you trying to preach the gospel? You're not trying to preach it, but you're not about that life. We're not trying to raise the dead, the dead, the dead bodies here. We're all out. <laughs> Do you realize that in Pentecostal churches, when people die, they don't allow you to bring them into the church? You can't bring a dead body in here. Yep. Oh, no. no, no. This is a place of life. We have problems. We're not trying to raise the dead. We're not, we're not trying to heal the sick. We just want to get married. That's all we want. I just want to marry. I'm, I'm lonely. I'm alone. Let me just marry. When I wake up in the morning, what am I praying for? My wife or my husband. All, all I'm thinking about is, is, you know, I just want my promotion. When I'm praying to God, when I'm crying out to the Lord, Lord, please, my, my, my colleagues at work, Lord, bring them to salvation. No, Lord, my colleagues at work, move them so that they can, <laughs> Lord, position me. We're not, we're not thinking about souls. We just want to get that bread, man. Let's go. Let's go. Monday morning, let's get that bread. How about let's save that soul? No, no Pastor. It's, it's all about the Benjamins. That's what it's about now. So the church has become a platform to advance, guess what, our material interests. Not kingdom agenda. All right. So what do, I need, what do I need the gifts of the Holy Spirit for? When all I want is to marry. All I want is promotion. All I want is to move from South Dallas to Highland Park. <laughs> what, 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 what do I need? Well, I don't need to raise the dead. I just need God to open the door for me. Give me the key of David so that I can... So I can unlock the door of prosperity and progress. 
The, the, the last problem, I have only four seconds left. Dang. We don't know how to distinguish between the voice of God and the voice of another. Let me read Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12. <laughs> Hebrews 5, verse 12. It says, in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers. Don't you know we say you ought to be a teacher? You've been, you've been in the church for so long. So long. You've been here every Sunday for the past five years. Clap for yourself. You ought to be a teacher. You are, you're actually clapping. You actually clapped. <laughs> Since by this time you ought to be teachers. He wasn't, he wasn't complimentary. He was chastising them. He says you, need, you still need someone to teach you the elementary truths of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature. What, what, is, what, is, what is the solid food that is for the mature? It's not revelations about the seventh and the eighth heavens. That's what we think. That, oh, this guy is very mature. He understands what Aaron's beard meant. It was just a beard, a lot of hair. So the, the anointing flowed from his head down to his, to his, his beard and, and the tassels of his garment. And the tassels mean this and the color means that. That is not what Paul is talking about. He's talking about the teaching about righteousness. That's what he's calling solid food. He says, but solid food is for the mature. The teaching of righteousness is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. We need training to be able to distinguish between good and evil. We need to be able to discern which voices we are hearing. We need to be able to analyze the data we get from the spiritual realm. But the first step to that understanding, Paul is telling us, is the teaching about righteousness. And we don't understand righteousness. A lot of what we believe about righteousness is not the word. What, what is the teaching about righteousness that leads us to do greater works than Jesus? The foundation of the miraculous. Romans chapter 4 verse 3 lays it out for us. For the scriptures tell us, Abraham believed God. And God counted him as righteous because of his faith. That is the foundation of the miraculous. And understanding that my righteousness is not based on my works but based on faith. So when you understand that righteousness is by faith, you have the boldness. The Bible says, let us come with boldness before the throne of grace, that we may receive grace to help us in this time of our need. But we do not have that boldness because we think that righteousness is based on our works. So we look at ourselves in the mirror and we remember the lie that we told yesterday and we disqualify ourselves as a consequence of our shortcomings. But the Bible says that Abraham, who... Some of us would have called a liar, maybe even a pathological liar, because every time he was threatened, he lied. Can you imagine calling his wife his sister? What, 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 what is that? A lie. He knew she was his wife. He was clear. There was no confusion. They were trying to have children. But God looked at him. And called him righteous. We have accepted this gospel. That righteousness is by works. So we disqualify ourselves from doing the works of Jesus. Because when you look at yourself, you don't qualify. You know the things you did. But that is not how God counts righteousness. He counts it by faith. What miracles did the keepers of the law perform? The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Those guys knew the Bible. They, they used to tithe mint leaves. Have you seen a mint leaf? That means that if they got a bunch of mint leaves, they had to count how many leaves were on that bunch. And then they would give a tithe of it. You think you tithe? <laughs> you that you are rounding up. They didn't round up anything. <laughs> They would, they would cut the mint leaves into tenths to get an accurate number. They, they obeyed the law without missing one. And what miracles did they perform? None. 
Rather than perform miracles, they became judgmental and hypocritical. But Jesus said, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you will speak to the mountain and the mountain will move. And what Jesus Christ was saying is that if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you will have the authority and the confidence to curse the fig tree, which is what he did. So what we're going to do, my time is up, is that we're going to be setting up training programs in Jesus' house. Amen? You know, to train people on, on, this thing is not rocket science. Somebody around you is sick, lay hands on the person. Let God heal the person. I'm going to be teaching and talking a lot about these things, about the gifts of the Spirit, about healing, about deliverance. Because we have the Spirit in us. We just need to know how to deploy him. And that is what the pastors are supposed to do. We're going to be judging ourselves by how many people are laying hands on the sick. Not by how many people are showing up. So I'm not impressed anymore with churches of 50,000 people who do nothing. Nothing. They just come there and go. A, a materialistic Christian is a powerless Christian. A self-centered Christian is a powerless Christian. And we have turned the gospel into a materialistic and a self-centered platform. I don't know about you guys, but I want to see you walk the work and do even greater than Jesus did. Amen. That is what we have been called to. I told them in the first service, I'm fired up. I'm tired of church. This this. this same old, same old, day in, day out. Go to Walmart and let people be, be you know, let people come there in, those, in those, those scooters. And then they encounter you. They don't know how they got up from the scooter and they're walking out of the store. Amen. Let people see you at Home Depot and receive a word that will transform their life. When you go to Mickey D's, the girl at the, at, at the checkout, let her get a word of prophecy from you. That's what the gospel is. When you want to go and buy a new car, the guy, the salesman that is trying to scam you into buying a car you can't afford, give him a word of knowledge, let him repent and change his life. <laughs> By the way, not all salesmen are trying to scam you. There's some pretty good ones like Alex. If you need to buy a car, go talk to Alex. It'll give you a good deal. But when they come to Alex and, 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 and he wants to sell them a car, let him have a word. Say, my brother, I know you want to buy a car, but you know this money that you want to spend on this car, you really can't afford it because you know a letter is coming tomorrow that is going to tell you that... <laughs> <laughs> the, the, car, the car salesmen are laughing. <laughs> They're they like, man, he's going to buy that car. <laughs> Let us bow our heads and pray. <laughs> Ask the Lord to put in your heart a hunger yes. for more than just your circumstances, for more than just your material comfort. Ask him to, to give you a, a heart that desires to see the kingdom expand, that desires to see souls saved. And the miraculous will follow. Father, we, we thank you and we bless you. Father, we give you praise. Almighty and ever-living King, we just, we just bless your name. Father, we know that you have called us to do the works that Christ did. And even greater works than he did. Father, we ask that you fill our hearts with the hunger for more than just new houses and new cars. Fill our hearts with our hunger to fulfill your purpose that we too may hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Father, we thank you and we bless you. Almighty God, we give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.